doing, you know, doing things that empower you to be part of the conversation, even if mm-hmm. they're um, small or illegal, um, <laughs> they make a difference. And, Don't know what you're talking about, Shepard. Don't know what you're yeah, talking about this illegality. It, put, it, it puts the powers that be on notice that they don't get to just um, proceed with impunity against the will of the people. And, and, uh, and you know, street art um, or graffiti or, you know, in any of these, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, acts of expression in public space might not seem like they matter much, but cumulatively it really does. And I mean, look at how, look at how threatened a lot of cities are by, by graffiti. They, you know, they prosecuted so disproportionately to, um, to what the, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a cosmetic offense. And, um, and yet they put people in jail over it. And, uh, you know, and a lot of people actually think it enhances a neighborhood. That's where, where we're getting into interesting territory now with the whole uh, argument of vandalism or gentrification. It depends on who you ask. For sure. And that, that's a beautiful space right now, right? Like, yeah. like killer, killer, podcast, killer, killer, official dot com. You need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Instagram UK Frontline. Killer Keller. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. To the races. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct central London, or as central as you need to be. Not exactly, but precisely. Big shout out to all the sharers and carers, the followers, the people that are spreading the gospel on street culture, whether it's graph, music, drum and bass, you name it. We've got it all on here, and you can get it more on the television app, free download, iPhone, Android, for all your street culture sports. Big shout out to the Hoddle Warriors over at the Crypto Moon Boys Hideout. That's some NFT business for you. Inside the house, we have the esteemed privilege of a gentleman that pretty much street art buck stops right with his name from uh, the clothing brand to the synonymous Andre the Giant to the Obama campaign, right the way through to album covers galore. You know, it is is obey Mr. Shepard Ferry inside the place. How are you, Jen? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on. Pretty extensive introduction, but we were kind of jumping into a conversation just just before about Mr. Upsky Bomb the Suburbs book, which is right behind me. Some pretty deep intel going on. Yeah, I you know I, I like that book just because of the title and the and the and the cover. Um, so when it came out in the '90s, I, I picked it up, and then uh, Upsky and I have known each other, and uh, he worked on a bunch of anti Iraq war stuff, and I was involved in that too. So we connected on that. He he's doing a lot of prison reform stuff um, also. So yeah, you know I haven't kept up with him lately, but. Um, I like that he is of the same mindset that I am that, you know, you, once you have the courage to, to question things and bend and break the rules, then you, you know, you go further than just, um, than just self-promotion. You do something that betters society and, uh, you Mm -hmm. know, not everybody gets that far, but I'm, I'm glad he and I are on the same page with that. For sure. You just mentioned anti-Iraq war and I, recollect that as a young man like most of these horrific you know and hum- inhumane atrocities um has been quite a, a, a potent one for for the age that it was is it the case that you've you, you've always been uh an, an an activist of that nature taking what you do and really targeting the establishment and what it stands for things like War, of course. Well, it's a good for absolutely nothing. But it's that kind of protest that I think is underpinned in a lot of your artwork, right? Yeah, it was a it was an evolution for me. I I grew up um, in the South. It was pretty conservative, and the breakthrough for me was discovering skateboarding and punk rock, and then of course, flowing from that, hip hop, um, Run DMC, the Beastie Boys. Public Enemy was the biggest one for me because of their outspoken political nature. But I, you know, I started to, you know, I loved Bob Marley, The Clash, The Dead Kennedys, 
um, Patty Smith, Bikini Kill, Public Enemy, Eric B and Rakim, Boogie Down Productions, NWA. So, so you know, and then Rage Against the Machine in the nineties. Um, mm-hmm. So the idea that art, um, whether it's you know music as an art form or visual art, can have something to say that was ingrained in me from from my teenage years and it took me a while to figure out exactly how to do it myself with the um you know the my foundational project the under the giant has a posse sticker that started off as an abs- absurd inside joke with some skateboard friends the only thing <laughs> political the only thing political to that was that it was disrupting um public space that it was public space is dominated by government signage and advertising from big corporations and you throw something out there that's um that that's diy that you know is um is a little bit rebellious then you know just by it interrupting the one-sided conversation from from government and commerce it's it's a little bit antagonistic and has a political side to it um, in that it's an act of defiance. But it took a while for me to develop um, a stronger a stronger confidence around expressing my ideas around social issues and um, political issues. But, you know, it, it did it did happen. It happened gradually through my 20s and really um, around the time George Bush um, the, the W got elected was when Mm. I really kicked into high gear with political stuff. Yeah. You were really off to the races at that point. Everything else up till that, that moment, like you say, you were, you were cultivating a, a batch of ideas coming to the conclusions that served you correctly. But these, this was mainly subtle commentation. It's commentary for the street, wasn't it? It was like you say, an act of defiance, just doing it, to to send a message but that message just got louder right (laughs) yeah yeah exactly and i i always liked the idea that um any act of of expression coming from somebody that doesn't have the same power as um political parties or government or um or or deep-pocketed corporations that um these these acts of of expression are a way of saying I have some power too. So yes. I love the polit- I love the politics of that because I think that the reason that a lot of people feel like spectators in the world is because you know it's rigged to make them feel that way. But there are there are antidotes, and you know of of course. Um, voting is important but doing you know doing things that empower you to be part of the conversation even if Mm -hmm. they're um small or illegal um (laughs) they make a difference (laughs) don't know what you're talking about Shepard. don't know what you're talking about this illegality it puts it it puts the powers that be on notice that they don't get to just um proceed with impunity against the will of the people and and uh you know street art um or graffiti or you know, in any of these, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, acts of expression in public space might not seem like they matter much, but cumulatively it really does. And I mean, look at how, look at how threatened a lot of cities are by, by graffiti. They, you know, they prosecuted so disproportionately to, um, to what the, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a cosmetic offense. And, um, and yet they put, people in jail over it and uh you know and a lot of people actually think it enhances a neighborhood that's where where we're getting into interesting territory now with the whole uh, argument of vandalism or gentrification it depends on who you ask for sure and that that's a beautiful space right now right like yeah. I, it throws it throws the, the them upstairs into complete disarray they haven't got a clue how to take it and also a lot of you know a lot of people our ages have gone up ranks in big marketing companies, big political organizations. They actually grew up on a lot of, for argument's sake, what what you created back back in the day. And now it's almost like, like you say, it's, it's kind of got a level of cultural appropriation that to some of the older, the the, the older um, 
uh, the, the elders, statesmen of uh, of these uh, organizations, they just don't know how to take it. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And I, you know, I, I have um, the philosophy that I, I'm not going to make blanket statements about anything because that's irresponsible. So I look at each situation, the complexities and the nuances, and and analyze it. And you know, for example. Um, you're talking about some people from the street world and whether it's, whether it's underground music or graffiti and, and, and street art have moved into marketing positions at places. And sometimes they work with brands that I think are cultural culture vultures. Other times mm. they're educating those brands about how to support the culture authentically where it's a symbiotic relationship. So I don't, you know, I don't say like, Oh, don't work with corporations. I, I like, uh, I embrace what I call the inside outside philosophy. If you, you always need to keep the mentality of, of, of making things happen outside the system when the system is hostile to you or doesn't allow you to infiltrate it and do what you want to do with integrity. Um, but integrity is the word, right? Integrity is the word. Yeah. Yeah. But if you can infiltrate the system and use its machinery to improve the system itself and spread, you know, spread good art, spread good messages, you'd be, foolish not to do that. So sometimes I see, I see people who are working within, um, a, you know, a corporate structure and yet they're facilitating things that are really great for culture. And then other times they're doing things that denigrate culture. And, mm. you know, so, mm-hmm. so I, um, it, it really is, has to be examined on a case by case basis. But do you find, and listen, I, I'm just I'm putting you on the pedal still here, and, and I hope you don't mind this. The flowers are definitely heading your way because I said at the top of the show, the buck stopped there. I, and I, I, of course, there are other contemporaries, but and and historically document, well, historically documented um, uh, uh, artists and people that ran the gauntlet of, of a time in graffiti, you know. Basquiat being one of them, you know, uh, the rat and, and 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 the like. But for me, you you the message was pretty clear. As much as it was subtle, the political slant, particularly you mentioned the graffiti right, the, the graffiti writers, and you also mentioned the rock and roll stars of the time, Rage Against the Machine. You know, the skateboard punk aesthetic was all about that, and and I think you garnered like a whole heap of people that 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 wanted to have the gauntlet as well and run it and over the course of time this it almost you know it became a it, it became part of the um part of the the, the 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 habitat of like you say the gentrification of it all is there anything that could it have, could it have been could it have changed um in a different way the way street art became because you were really sending a message out there at the time. There's always good and bad with how things evolve. And yeah, I, there's a, there's a, a million areas I could go into, but one of the things that I did appreciate about street art and graffiti before, before they were embraced by broader culture um, to the extent that they are now. And I mean, and, you know, I have to qualify that by saying that graffiti had, had movies like wild style and, oh yeah, you know, and then, and then things that incorporated graffiti, like, like break in and beat street. Those were big things back in, back in the eighties. But, um, but graffiti generally has been an underground culture that a lot of people hated law enforcement hated a lot of property owners hated. Um, so there was always a, there was always a tribal bond with people who really had to exist as outsiders. And, um, I'm friends with a lot of graffiti writers. I'm, I've never claimed to have any authenticity in graffiti myself because I'm not, um, somebody that writes my name with a spray can, but I've always loved that culture. And then the same thing in, in street art, whether it's people like um, Phil Frost, who was early on, um, my friend in, in New York City, you know, Re- Revs and Cost, a lot of Swoon, Fail, a lot so, of, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you bring them up. That's awesome. 
a lot of these people um, were really doing what they were doing purely to connect with an audience in public space without thinking at all about how it was going to ever turn into something commercial. And also you only could get fame based on coverage because especially prior to the internet, you, you, you couldn't be um, just taking flattering photos of like three spots and having those proliferate out into the, into the digital realm, you, you know, you had to actually do stuff that people saw. So the work ethic. Yeah, for sure. You know, let I, alone, let alone going to a, a, dev- a you know, a photo developing store. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I mean the work ethic about the coverage, but then even, you know, documentation, I remember sending photos into some of the graffiti and street art mags and, you know, you're waiting for months to potentially mm-hmm. get, you know, a quarter page thing of coverage and, that's the best you're going to get. Now, I think all the digital tools are really great in how they empower people and democratize things, but it also changes a lot of people's calculation because, mm-hmm. hey, everybody knows the phrase, you know, internet famous, overnight internet fame is what a lot of people are craving. So it, they're, not, they're not driven by the same motivations. So, you know, I, I can't, I can't change that, but if they're, if you're asking me like, what would I like to see different in the evolution? Mm -hmm. I'd like to see, um, I'd like to see the motivation be, you know, the art, not the hype. And, um, and, you know, maybe that sounds ironic coming from me when I've been in exit through the gift shop and other things that have been hyped, but that wasn't, you know, I didn't. I didn't set out to have it pan out that way. <laughs> that's just yeah, yeah, way, I feel you. That's just the way it ended up shaking out. <laughs> but you know what? I, I, I think the, an important thing for me to convey is that culture evolves organically, and I, I put the signals out there of you know what my values are and what I'd like to see. But I, I don't. Um, when it doesn't go exactly the way I'm hoping for. I just keep trying to broadcast what is what you know what I think is important and rather than worrying about criticizing other people that I think maybe have um pushed things in a direction I'm not interested in because leading by example is much more important than starting beef with people who are just doing something their way and have a different opinion that's you know it's just not it's just not how I want to spend my time Shepard you are good, aren't you? You really are. I don't know where you this 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 conversation alone is testament to what people admire you for, and and I, I, it begs me to ask: like, do, at any point when you first started out, did you did you ever consider the the prospect of having this these kind of conversations? It, it feels it must feel like many moons ago, but the uh, you know you you your vocabulary, the way you explain and express things, it's so well-rounded. It's, it's um, worldly. It's, it's with a deep understanding. It's not trying to cut into people. It's also leading by example. Like, did you ever think you were going to be be in this place where you'd, you'd be talking, you know, on podcasts and newspapers and, you know, doing huge campaigns. This is this, this you've got to learn this kind of craft, don't you? Yeah. I, um, I'm incredibly grateful that I have a, a an audience that cares about what I'm doing and that somebody like you wants to have me on to, to, to express my ideas. I learned early on in art school that if I couldn't speak about my work, then I was handicapping myself. And I always felt it was most important for the art to draw people in so they'd want to talk about it. But then a lot of people are not confident in interpreting art without a little bit of back up to validate their 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 experience or their ideas so in critique in art school i learned that Mm -hmm. some of the people with with really terrible art were great at talking about it and it seemed to (laughs) it seemed to seduce and and, you know and and enroll everyone in what they were doing even when the i when the art wasn't that great so i thought all right well my art can use all the help it can get so i'm going to figure out how to articulate what i'm doing and that's just something that I've um, 
through practice, gotten more and more skilled at doing. And, and so I'm, you know, I'm grateful that people care about the art and I always want the art to be taking the lead, but I also have a lot to say with what I'm, you know, what I'm doing philosophically and the content of the work. And so, yeah, I'm glad to be able to talk about it also. I rate that, man. And that's why the fans love you, man. That's why supporters and people of intrigue. Let's get into the art, the art itself. Now, the box font, which which was synonymous for for Obey. Do you remember? Do you remember a uh, an artist called Jenny Holzer? Oh yeah, of course. Um, but you know, the inspiration for me was Barbara Kruger, and Whoa, okay. you know, Holzer and Kruger both use text driven art, but Kruger is the one who uses the red bar with the white Futura bold knocked out of the bar, and that's of course what Supreme was inspired by. For sure. Um, and it was what I was inspired by. Kruger used Futura in lowercase and uppercase, bold and not bold. So what Supreme did around the same time that I made my Obey logo was just make something inspired by Barbara Kruger because she was pretty much the, you know, the top of the heap when it came to merging uh, a street aesthetic, a propaganda aesthetic and an advertising aesthetic. It's because perfect. She, it was she it, came yeah. she came from advertising, so she understood, you know, strong typography with spot color in front of a photographic image, and yeah, you know, I responded to that. Supreme responded to that, and uh, I, I, you know, I, I did not. Um, there's a lot of people that want to battle about. Oh, Supreme did it first. Obey did it first. Neither one of us copied each other. We both copied Barbara Kruger. Yo, I rate that so hard, and the fact that. You took it and Supreme, big up Supreme as well. Um, not that they need much bigging up from uh, the podcast like mine, but the, the 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 fact is that when I think of the um, the all American look of the late nineties to the noughties, that font, that the that box lettering font, Futura, it became it became a staple. I think for you know for the MTV generation, the much music generation. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, this is the fascinating thing about how aesthetic trends reach a critical mass. You know, the, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, you know, the wellspring, um, a lot of times isn't even understood by most people. And it might be much more obscure than, say, something that eventually manifests. Like Supreme is much better known. Than Barbara Kruger, yet yeah, Barbara right. Kruger is, you know, is a, a titan in the art world. And that that aesthetic that Barbara Kruger had was um was something that I think um influenced streetwear, street culture. Um, and then once it's once it's circulating within, you know, within street culture and streetwear, then you know it it's off to the races because people are just going off of the vibe that what they see people are down with. And then, you know, they, they build on that. And that's the, that's the beauty of skateboard culture, music culture, street culture. Mm. And it, it, that's very different from, from fine art culture. Fine art culture is, it's very critical. It's very academic. So if you say like, oh yeah, I'm just down with this because I, I dig the way it looks and I, 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 you know, I just, I'm getting a vibe that I like, people would tear you apart in the fine art world, but yeah. it's fine. It's fine to roll like that in street culture. And that's what's so great is that it's democratic, it's organic. Um, it also means that some people are really shallow about what they're doing. But what I always think is shallowness is always going to be there. How do I lure that person into a deeper conversation, even if they begin from a shallow standpoint? So that's what I love about fashion. Fashion is a gateway to the rest of my art practice that um, is, is potentially going to lead somebody to seeing what I'm trying to accomplish socially, politically, artistically on more than just clothing. And if somebody doesn't make it past the clothing itself, OK, that's all right. The shallow entry hole to fashion, um, 
like you say, that there doesn't actually have to be any question and answer to anything. If it looks good on a person, it looks good. The dynamics are slowly shifting a little bit. Um, controversial characters like Kanye and right way through to how um, how people perceive the, the human body these days. You know what I mean? And whether it's too... Too fat, too thin, or whatever. You know, this is it's all it's all totally subjective to the person and what they're wearing. Um, fashion, fashion has to um, work with this in the same way. Graffiti has to work with it in the aesthetic of the city. It's reactive, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And you know, I, I'm always excited by how people adapt to the specific needs of a context and, you know, graffiti, you're using, you're using tools that don't lend themselves well to, um, angular, um, linear things. So, um, the combination of the limitations of, of spray paint as a tool, and then the, not necessarily the limitations, because there are people that can spray paint almost anything, but I'm saying For sure. what's what's conducive, um, and then and then you look at the you know the need to work with unpredictable surfaces, and the aesthetics of graffiti rise out of that. When you look at how a T-shirt graphic, for example, if I make poster graphics and they're meant to work in a rectangle, that might look really boxy and static on a T-shirt. So how a T-shirt where a graphic works with the human figure. Um, you know, that's something that I'm adapting to. So, you know, when I see people who work in several contexts and mediums and they figure out how to have some continuity, but also specific adaptation, that's when I think somebody's a good artist, a good designer. Mm, I feel that. I feel that. Um, let's stay on the, the fashion thing for a second, because I remember some of the earlier um, Bay um, articles. There was one, it was almost like a, uh, a paper round bag that you had. And I actually, I actually, copped it in Toronto I think when I was on tour and um it had it, it had almost a newspaper uh uh design ladled across it and then you had baseball caps that again in a real kind of suggestion of propaganda had it almost like the newspaper article um uh text and positioning of it just looked so it, it looked so um punk almost had a punk aesthetic to it interesting thing is that I overlap with a lot of different subcultures and in my interest, but punk rock has been, was, was a, was a really early important one for me. And that idea of, um, alternative media, whether, you know, that's making zines or homemade t-shirts or whatever, um, posters, punk bands, making flyers, that aesthetic has always been part of what I'm into. But for me, it's merged frequently with, um, other forms of uh, other aesthetics of propaganda, Russian constructivist pro propaganda yes. um, yeah. was always a big influence for me because aesthetically it was so powerful and so far ahead of what the rest of the world was doing. It's not that um, philosophically any of any of what I'm doing is about, uh, you know, a, a, a communist agenda, um, you know, even though I do like the Marxist philosophy of from each according to his or her ability to each according to his or her need because mm -hmm. it's a little more generous in spirit but um but I, uh, I i'm i'm accepting that that philosophy has to has to be something that's selectively implemented within capitalism so <laughs> yeah. um but but anyway you know the, these aesthetics it's it's all about my interests and the way that some of these points of view can be subtly conveyed in a, and, and sometimes not subtly, sometimes really directly, but oftentimes subtly conveyed in fashion. And, you know, for, for everything that's got that, um, punk rock bike messenger vibe with the bag, um, to, you know, there's, there's something that on the flip side is a little more slick and, and, and works for somebody that's into, you know, that's into, into hip hop, you know? So if you're, you know, if you're listening to, the clash or you're listening to jay-z we might have something in the exact same line at different ends of the spectrum that's going to work for you and mm -hmm. you know that's just because I, those are my interests that's not some slick uh you know 
it doesn't come across Our market, as contrived. Marketing ploy. It's just yeah. it's just organically how the line works. And I'm the creative director of the brand, but I have um, Mike Ternoski, who's the cut and sew designer, who is a, a is about five years younger than I am, but comes from the same place: skateboarding, snowboarding, DJ culture, hip hop, punk rock, um, heavy metal like Black Sabbath, um, mm-hmm. you know, street, streetwear culture. So, so like you know, when when he and I are working on things, it's it's always a blend of our influences as well as paying attention to what's going on now and saying. Um, yeah, what's exciting about what's happening now? What's what you know? What's currently happening aesthetically that 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 is aligned with our values and is you know maybe not um, since we're not fifteen anymore. Not what is our you know formative aesthetic because everybody everybody latches on to the aesthetics that were um, dominant when they were figuring out who they are, really coming into their own personality. Sure. Wise. But I can, I can still look at something that's happening now with say like a uh, digital culture. That's the, the digital equivalent of zine making that, that went with all the punk rock zines and skate zines, but it's now happening online and say, ah, I can embrace that mentality with some of the things I'm doing because it's just a different manifestation of the same spirit of working I, I, and you're absolutely right stay, stay on that for on the on the music for a second because um you know uh black eyed peas led zeppelin uh anthrax I, at this point i've got to big up um dj z trip as well that's my guy um you've worked with a lot of different artists and when i see the album covers that you create whether it's officially or unofficially, the way that you construct them, um, I, I feel like there, there isn't. Hmm. I can see that there's an attention to identifying a, a, a level of uniqueness to the artist that you're working with, but there must be this. There must be an element of their preferences to be like, well, yeah, we're, we're, we're working with Shepard Ferry. It's, it's got to look like that. You know what I mean? It's got to look like the Don has done the cover, right? <laughs> there must be this balance that you're always working on. Well, it, it that's nice of you to say. For me, it's always most important to make sure that the mus- the musicians are happy because – it's their visual representation of themselves. You know, it's, Mm. um, you know, I'm not asking them to soundtrack my art. (laughs) They're they're (laughs) asking me to, to visualize their music. As much, as much as the, you know, the 15 year old and you asking Anfrax, you know, (laughs) that is totally what they're doing, isn't it really? (laughs) But, um, a lot of the people I've worked with are people I've been a fan of since I was, since I was young. So whether it's Blondie or Led Zeppelin, um, Billy Idol, mm. the, the, oh, and they, they already have an established aesthetic. And so I'm looking at how I evolve their aesthetic in a way that their audience can, um, can, can connect with, but also that there's something new being brought to the, being brought to the equation because um, the, you know, that's where the sweet spot is. It's, mm-hmm. it's, um, it's a feeling of, um, warmth from something you already like and, and seeing the connection to that, but also feeling like there's a, something exciting about a new iteration and a progression. So, um, sometimes I've gotten to work with people like Interpol where, you know, I got to do more or less, um, what I wanted and they, they have a defined aesthetic too that's very, uh, sort of film noir and and um, sophisticated, but mm-hmm. I can, you know, I I can bring my thing to that in a way that's um, more, yeah, you know, I I guess more open because when I first started working with Interpol, they only had one record out, and so I've been working on various projects with them ever since then. It wasn't like working with Led Zeppelin, where you know they've got um, many albums and, you know, and, and, and many different things that people know them for where I felt I had to operate within, uh, a, 
a zone that was more respectful of their visual legacy. For sure, um, and, a gener- and a generation as well. I mean, there must be a sense yeah. of real pride and um, attentiveness to this, you know. You you can't just, even some of the, 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 the aforementioned you mentioned there, of, of it, but, yeah, you mentioned... Um, I guess a sympathetic kind of approach. Bad brains, you know, they, they've got such a a legacy. It's Led Zeppelin got such a legacy. It's like you've got to you've got to be a fan first, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, with, with the various things I've done with Bad Brains, it's always um, their you know really their first two records, Rock for Light and and the Roar cassette with the Capitol being struck by lightning. Mm they set the template for their style. And so, um, you know, everything has to feel like it's in that spirit. I've done stuff for the misfits and they have Amazing. such a recognizable aesthetic. If you, if you move away from that aesthetic, you will be slaughtered by their Do- audience. No, and Doyle will hurt you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, you do not want to tangle with Doyle. He's actually no. a really sweet guy, but, um, but very intimidating. Yeah, um, okay. but you know, the, um, But that's one of the things that I enjoy about working with artists that have built a strong visual legacy, but want it to continue it growing is that there's a narrow space to work in, but sometimes narrow constraints mean that um, you have to be more innovative within those constraints. And I like solving that problem. I also have my own art that I can do whatever I want but I set up my own constraints because I like the idea of continuity and evolution and that the power of my work comes from a cumulative impact that people see one piece and they might think it's okay. They see the next one that they connect and the next one. And all of a sudden it feels like, um, you know, not just a piece here and there, but almost like a movement. And um, Mm. so that's why the, the evolution of my work has been, pretty easy to follow. And even though there's constantly new things I'm introducing, there will be things that are consistent, whether it's some of the, um, some of the logoing or iconography that I use on a regular basis, some of the colors, um, you know, the style of, of the style I use for portraiture, all those things are, are recognizable. And, you know, as I weave new things in, there's always some residue of the old that people can use to connect to. Yeah, like that silver lining work. that runs throughout the whole thing. Yeah. Consistency and with constraint. It's like, yeah, it's like, yeah. it's like, the, it's like the, it's basically the, the graffiti mentality of a tag. It's like, it's almost like repetition is key to create the movement that you're after. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, um, it's amazing to see the evolution of a taggers, um, work, how it might not even be perceptible until you look at photos from 10 years before, um, and then look at newer photos. There, there's some artists like twist Barry McGee, who started as a traditional tagger, then started to incorporate characters, then later started to incorporate patterns and, Mm -hmm. um, and and other graphic motifs and I, you know i look at i look at twist's work and how it's you can see threads all the way back from the mid mid 90s early 90s to what he's doing now but what he's doing now is just incredibly rich and sophisticated compared to the stuff from the 90s so yeah i think i think that um progression is inevitable when somebody is creating all the time. Um, but you, you know, sometimes as an artist, you have to look at, um, how you find the, the best synergy between your own progression and your audience's, um, progression with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's super important, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. Especially in something like fashion, which is very, um, very fickle and very, you know, changing constantly. Mm. Um, the you know, I think the art world sometimes will allow you to make some radical departure from the previous body of work and even applaud that if it's exciting. Mm. Um, a lot of times, the fashion world goes, uh, <laughs> "You you lost us there." What happened? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and never mind the people that are wearing it. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. So look, we're going to wrap this up pretty soon because I know, uh, you know, time is of the essence and uh, the time difference is is upon us. Um, all right, quick fire question. Uh, favorite campaign you've done? Oh, wow. Um, so you're talking about something, something commercial. Yeah, sure. Um, Let's do one commercial and one non-commercial. There you go. Okay. Well, back um, in... 2000 there was a movie about the comedian and prankster andy kaufman um called man on the moon it was jim carrey was playing andy kaufman mm -hmm. andy kaufman had been on the show taxi he'd been on saturday night live and he was a real subversive character and i was asked to make portraits of andy kaufman and his and his uh, alter ego tony clifton and then help with the campaign to put those up on the street and there were portraits of the real Andy Kaufman and the real Tony Clifton, not portraits of Jim Carrey, but this was subsidized by Universal Pictures who mm. did the movie. And they knew that interest in Andy Kaufman would stimulate interest in the movie. Now, the movie is a good movie, but I was most interested in this because Andy Kaufman was a great character and being paid to make people curious about, about him was um, – Pretty much, you know, like the most ideal kind of job you could get. Now, there have sure. been plenty of other things that work like that, but that was a, you know, that was my, one of my first real windows into um, that idea of getting inside the machine and using its machinery for a purpose that, um, you know, goes way beyond the corporate agenda. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like hijacking the machinery for, for for something pretty exciting and um and, and and subversive like tony kaufman so there you know that was that was great dude and, how um, do you go back from that once you've had that you know that's a rare opportunity isn't it well it is but it also was a really good learning experience for me because it gave me the confidence to say to future future corporate clients and for for years i couldn't make a living as an artist so i've worked as a graphic designer mm -hmm. and and you know, um, and, and marketing person, creative director. And so that gave me the confidence to say to people that would come to me and say like, oh, you know, we're going to do this video game thing and we want to make it look like someone illegally intervened in a, in a billboard campaign, but then put up the character from the game in the billboard. And I go, but that's not, that's not authentic. Mm. People are going to spot that as a corporate fake out and then they're going to be really mad that that happened. Yeah. Um, you'd be better off giving billboards that would normally have an ad to artists that then, you know, incorporate something that loosely connects to the game. But then it's incubating an artist, giving them an opportunity to be paid to do something that's similar to what they would do anyway. 100%. And then, and then the perception is that the brand supports culture rather than exploits culture. Which and, is win-win for everybody, right? So, you know, I, I developed some some confidence to to talk to people about that, and then you know later on when I got to be more choosy about the jobs I took, uh, if people didn't want to listen to my advice along those lines, then we could just part ways. Um, oh, nice. But uh, the 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 you know sometimes I felt like I was saving these brands from themselves because what they're trying to do is going to backfire anyway. Well, they're kind um, of stuck in the eighties, the way of marketing and, and industry doesn't like yeah. change, does it? You know? No, but, um, you know, non-commercial, probably the most exciting campaign was when I worked on three of the posters for the, we, the people campaign, which were posters mm. in response to Trump's election. And, um, and we're, seen as um the posters that were created for the first women's march which was the day after trump's inauguration in 2017 now those posters were similar in aesthetic to the obama hope poster but they were of people who weren't famous so they, they were the groups of people that trump was attacking um so there was a um an african-american a uh, boy with dreadlocks that a lot of people thought was a, a woman, but wasn't. It was a you know a younger a younger boy and um, who's sort of androgynous, and then a Latino woman with a rose in her hair and a um, 
and a, and a Muslim woman with an American flag hijab on. But the way that those things went viral and the way that we created um, advertisements that went in the Washington Post, USA Today, the New York Times, um, that people could then hold up at the at the Women's March or at the or at the Trump inauguration because you weren't allowed to bring signs into the Trump inauguration, but that was how we hacked that system mm. and got, you know, you could bring a newspaper in and then people just opened it up. I mean, that, that campaign that I did with um, Amplifier, which is a, a, it's a nonprofit that's, you know, art, art driven social activations. Um, mm. That was, that was really incredible because it, for having the free downloads of those images meant that it went, it went viral globally. That's um, incredible. You know, the whole world was um, impacted by Trump being elected. And, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of groups of people from, from, you know, Germany, London, um, you know, all over the world. I mean, there was a, there was a, um, an Antarctica protest holding the, we, the people post. Wow. You know, oh, um, God, son. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, wow. Wow. The, these things to see these things happen is, is amazing. And, um, it's humbling too, because to see something go global like that, where I, you know, I'm, I'm effectively providing the tools that capture, um, you know, the spirit of the moment and the need of the moment um, to be able to pull that off with all the complex variables that mm. make people decide what they're going to focus their energy on is, um, you know, it's not an easy thing to do and it's very fortunate for anyone when it happens. I'm, mm. you know, I've been in this for 30 plus years now and I realize that you can't expect lightning in a bottle every time. No, that's true. And, and, uh, contrary to the internet uh, and the social media platforms, you know, these things, once they do bang, you know, those heydays are far more limiting for you on the way down. You just got to kind of keep a consistency, don't you? Yeah. And, and I think it's important to, to be tenacious. Um, you know, I'm, I'm quite, uh, I'm quite dedicated to everything I believe in, whether it seems to resonate in immediately or not. And uh, I like the I like the saying that luck favors the well prepared. Mm. I try to I, tr I try to be well prepared all uh, you know for for whatever's going on in the world. And you know sometimes I make something around an issue and it really connects, and other times it it doesn't. But I know that I've given it my best shot. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's that's the that's the best. That is the most you could ever do. And be be there, show up, isn't it? Be yeah, present. Exactly, exactly. Okay, one last question before we jump out. I want one of the most um, hell raising, um, anarchic, um, illegal uh, mission stories of you in your heyday, going out and piecing, postering, flyering. I want, I want, I want, I want a story that's never been put out there. You, I, I know you've got them. I know you've got some. Yeah, well, I, I've, I've told a lot of them, but um, I think that one that I haven't really talked about, which is more of a, a it, it, it's, it's not one specific harrowing thing, though there were various harrowing things on this trip, but I think it's to give a little bit of credit to Terry Guetta, AKA Mr. Brainwash, not as an artist, but as a, but, but as, as, as an enthusiast for the culture, because before, before Mr. Brainwash was ever trying to be an artist, which I don't really want to comment about anyway, but um, mm -hmm. uh, he was, he was a, a, a documentarian and, if you saw Exit to the Gift Shop, you know that he's Space Invader's cousin and that he got yeah. he got the bug from Space Invader. And that's how I met Terry was through Space Invader back in 99. But Terry lives in L.A. Terry is Mr. Brainwash. Mm -hmm. um, and he started documenting me a lot. And in 2000, we took several trips to New York. But I remember in 2003, we went to New York 20 years ago. We went to New York and... Um, 
the first thing Terry does is when we, we rented a car and we're driving in from JFK, he puts a video camera on the hood of the car with a suction cup and we go over a pothole and it bounces off and, you know, goes into the street. And the first thing, you know, he, he says, Oh, it, I, you know, I, I, um, I have more, I have more cameras. I mean, this was a guy who he wow. just wanted the juicy stuff. Mm-hmm. He didn't really care whether it was dangerous, whether he was going to lose ex- expensive equipment. And so he was a really great bombing partner for that reason. Sure. No fucks given, right? Yeah. So on the, on this, um, on this trip, we, um, I mean, we, we stayed up for, for three days in a row. We basically didn't sleep. I, I, I clocked it in that we slept in eight, eight hours in three days. Um, and, um, we, I was still really broke then. So we were in like a flea bag hotel and we would take turns napping here and there because we didn't, I didn't want to be, have to pay for putting the car into a lot because that was expensive. So we had, but all the meters are two hours. So like we could catch a nap for two hours and then have to go feed the meter or move mm-hmm. the car. And, um, on that trip, I think I, I think I bought, I think I hit about 25 big spots, maybe, maybe more, maybe 30 wow. in, in three days. Um, and there were points where I was like, yeah, Terry, you know, I'm hardcore about this, but do you want to sleep some? And he'd say, no, let's do more. Let's do more. And, um, you know, it wasn't even, he wasn't even putting art up at the time. He was giving that kind of energy and enthusiasm in support of me. And, you know, there was one spot where I saw a, a water tower and it's in exit through the gift shop i think or maybe it's in my documentary the obey giant doc but um there's a water tower on the roof in chinatown and it had it had it had tags around three quarters of it but there was one spot that was blank i Mm -hmm. didn't figure out why until i got up there but i had to go up a fire escape it was in the summer and people had their windows open so i had to sneak by people sleeping with their windows open where they're in bed like five feet from where i'm going up the fire escape (laughs) And uh, it was about it was about five thirty in the morning, so it was just starting to get light. And um, and I'm carrying my bucket and my uh, my glue and my um, posters in a backpack, a rope so that I could tie the bucket to a rope if I needed to climb up and then hoist the bucket up. But I get to the I get to the water tower and I realize why there's the open spot where I'm intending to put my huge poster is because the wooden platform of the water tower has disintegrated and now there's no platform there. So I look around on the roof and I find a two by eight that's about 10 feet long. So I climb up the thing with the two by eight and lay it across two pieces of metal to create a, you know, a very, very rickety um, small platform. and then. And then I go and then I pull the bucket up. I stand on this thing, which is bowing in the middle. I tie part of the rope to um, my belt, the other the other part of the rope to the um, to the to the railing of the the tower. And then, um, you know, it's a three story drop from up there down to the roof, (laughs) Um, (laughs) you know, eight, six, eight stories to the ground. but I, I, you know, I go and I and I get the piece up there and um, you know, and uh, and and go back down and uh, and you know, of course, um, Terry filmed it the whole time, and a lot of what he filmed was out of focus. Um, <laughs> Did you do that again? Him, I said, "Why is this? Why is this out of focus?" And he goes, "Oh, because I was trying. I wasn't really paying close attention. I was trying to put stickers up at the same time." I he was putting my, he was helping me put up my stickers, but, um, <laughs> but you know, this is the sort of thing where I'm like, I just did something that was really, really gnarly. Um, I, I wanted it well documented, but he's, but he's, you know, in a way, uh, poetically putting up stickers, that's more important to him than, than, get, you know, getting the footage. But if you look at exit to the gift shop and you see how a lot of the footage footage is quite shaky, 
I'm giving you just a a, a, a small vignette of why. <laughs> so, anyway, Dick Dastardly and Muttley just brings to mind there. It's just, you've got to kind of, you got to knock them on there. What are you doing, man? This was the most gnarliest moment I had. You know, this was one of my greatest uh, moments of the trip. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there've been. I've been arrested eighteen times. There've been a lot of times I've had to run the police. I got away from a police helicopter in L.A., which was made me feel like I was in an Ice Cube video or something. That's very impressive. I, yeah, I, you know, I thought, yeah, that's that's some street cred. But um, but you know, it all it all comes with risks, and um, the risks it comes with are from the same people that I'm pushing back against. So it's sort of just inherent to the nature of what I'm doing. It makes, it makes sense. And when people say, Oh, you've been arrested and you're diabetic, they've taken your insulin away. You've gotten sick. Why, why do you keep doing it? It's because I, you know, I don't want to give in to the exact same forces I'm pushing back against. Mm, I'm not going to let one hell of a mission brief. That is one hell of a mission brief. You got, you, 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 you have to go with your instinct, go with your gut, go with your morals, right? Yeah. And, don't get me wrong. There's a couple of cops I know who are really nice people. And I'm not saying every cop is terrible. All authority is terrible, but all, all authority needs to be questioned and all authority, um, you know, it, it is likely to abuse its power if unchecked. So, mm-hmm. you know, the, these are, these are all principles that are existing within my work. I just did, I just did the portrait for the former mayor of LA, who's a, who's an acquaintance and, you know, who I, who I think is a very decent human being. So it's not that I won't, I won't do things that are, are interfacing with the, the, the system, quote unquote. It's that I think that the system always needs um, to be, to be uh, beholden to the people, to the citizens. Uh, what couldn't have coined it perfectly in any other way. I completely agree with you, man. It has to be, it has to work for the people. Hmm. My brother, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Yeah, likewise, Kella. It's been fantastic. Yeah, man. I, I just want to big up Risk as well, MSK, because it's a mutual friend of ours. Um, oh, yeah. He and I have collaborated a lot. OG <laughs> Innovator for LA. Without question, an OG. And I mean, the compound itself, I mean, he gave us a walk tour for the show, and <laughs> that's a. I mean, he's he's he, you know he's a he's a um, he's a he's a position of uh, uh, high authority in in LA. I dare say he's he's the upstanding citizen, the modelist graffiti artist of LA, right? There's a lot of great people. I mean, I have to give um, Casey Eclipse from the Seventh Letter props. Uh, Revoke is now in in Detroit, but you know he's very important. Saber, I mean, there's a there's mm. there's a ton of there's a ton of important people. Chaz Bajorquez, um, mm. oh, you know, Chaz is in, is is in the show. Um, I believe he was in the LA show, of course. I mean, there's there's uh, Mr. Cartoon. There's so many important people sure. from the LA scene who I, I you know I feel lucky to know and lucky to have been inspired by. Yeah, for sure. And big up the likes of UTI crew, Hex, all those, the, the original characters yep. from, yep. from that old Downset as well. Hold tight, Ray Downset. Uh, another amazing punk band there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just keeps on going, man. Um, long live your career, Shepard. Keep it moving, my brother. It's a pleasure chatting to you. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, it was great to, great to join you and uh, keep Keep rocking in the semi-free world. <laughs> Indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller podcast out like in was out of fashion. You know what it do. Crime don't pay, but neither do they. All right, stay out of trouble. Don't talk to anyone, I wouldn't. And you stay lucky, people. Peace. Thank you, Shepard, your legend. All right, good to see you, man.